Welcome to Global Currents, coming to you from the WASP Center for Dialogue in Vancouver. This documentary series presents challenging ideas and fresh approaches to issues in Canada. Hello, I'm Kevin Newman. Each week, our independent documentary film partners bring us stories that stir dialogue. They're a great match for this room of debate. With warnings about the world's dwindling oil supply, a controversial energy source is increasingly being embraced, nuclear power, the same technology that powers atomic weapons like those that destroyed Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Few know it, but a mine in the Northwest Territories was instrumental in making those bombs, and now demand has led to its reopening. It means economic opportunity, but it also means painful memories. Filmmaker David Hennison takes us to Samba K, the money place, caught between the potential of the future and the lessons of the past. Canada's Northwest Territories, one of the last pristine areas in the world. Japanese are flocking to this Arctic frontier in record numbers to witness the aurora borealis phenomenon. The beauty and mystery of the northern lights have lit up the sky above this land for eons. But what has remained in the dark is the Japanese connection to this land in one of the 20th century's most defining moments. that the first atomic bomb was dropped on Hiroshima, a military base. We won the race of discovery against the Germans. We have used it in order to shorten the agony of war, in order to save the lives of thousands and thousands August of young 6th, Americans. August 6th, 1945. The world's first atomic bomb is detonated over Hiroshima. The story of the making of the atomic bomb, the people involved, and its devastating effects have all been well documented. But few realize where in 1942 the Manhattan Project came looking for the Western world's only proven source of uranium. Or where over 60 years later the worldwide awakening nuclear renaissance is returning for more. Shanghai, China, home to the world's fastest growing economy and seven of the world's 10 most polluted cities. China is reliant upon often unlicensed coal mines to feed power stations for approximately 70% of its energy needs. But this is set to change. To fuel its growing economy, China is forging ahead with its ambitious plans to harness the power of the atom. 32 new nuclear power plants over the next 15 years have been scheduled, more than doubling its reliance on the controversial source. Japan as well is going nuclear, with five more nuclear power plants scheduled to be built by 2010. Together, Japan and China are leading the world into a new nuclear renaissance that is being embraced by some unlikely allies. My old colleagues in Greenpeace thinks that we can phase out both fossil fuels and nuclear energy, where are they going to get the electricity? You know, and they, then they start talking about solar panels and my eyes glaze over because that isn't a logical or feasible thing to do. I'm in the camp that believes that if we actually want to make a serious reduction of fossil fuel consumption for electricity, the only practical solution is a combination of renewables and nuclear. Ontario and the government of Ontario having an energy shortage, an electricity shortage uh, looming in, in the province uh, has done a thorough study of the options. And of course they're quite worried about clean air and Kyoto and, and it really 
ultimately caused them to conclude that maintaining their nuclear supply at about 50% is a good idea. And hence the decision then that meant refurbishment of existing units and the building of some additional units. And it might be two, it might actually be more than that. The growing worldwide nuclear renaissance has fueled a dramatic rise in the price of uranium. From a low of $7 in 2000 to a high of over $47 a pound in 2006. New York's Hard Assets Investment Conference is abuzz with talk of uranium. 125 mining executives outline their production and exploration goals in projects across North America and around the world. With China and India joining the modern world, it's half the world's population, I figured that they would need energy of all kinds. And with the risks involved with fossil fuel and of course global warming and the possible disruption by terrorists, uranium would be the thing that they would have to go for because the whole world will eventually go from fossil to fissile and from carbon-based to mineral-based. And there's enough uranium in the world for centuries to come. The nuclear renaissance is turning to Canada, the largest producer and exporter of uranium in the world today. Northern Saskatchewan is referred to as the Saudi Arabia of uranium mining. It contains the richest uranium ore bodies in the world. Uranium grades here are at 23 percent, 100 times higher than the world average. The Athabascan Basin presently dominates the uranium production in Canada. And to the north of it is the Thelon Basin, which is basically virgin. And the native Canadian tribes are just basically beginning to sell their rights to allow this mining to come in. And um, you're going to see a, a big opening in the Thelon Basin, and Alberta Star is leading the way. The CEO of Alberta Star, Tim Copeland, is the brother of best-selling author Douglas Copeland, who also happens to be a major shareholder in the company. It has seen its stock price soar from 20 cents to almost $3, an increase of 1,500 percent, and has become one of the fastest growing mining exploration companies in North America. The age of fossil fuels is coming to an end, and what's going to keep the lights on, it's going to be uranium. With the resurgence in uranium prices and what we call the sort of the new renaissance, the exploration companies are getting significantly finer, particularly if there's uranium or a sniffer uranium in the area. Driving the company's soaring stock price is speculation that the Satu Dene First Nations will allow new uranium mining at an old abandoned mine, known to the Dene as Samba K, the money place. The abandoned mine sits on the eastern shores of Great Bear Lake, the eighth largest freshwater lake in the world. 265 kilometers to the west is the Satu Dene village of Delane, population 565, the only settlement on the gigantic lake. The Colorado mine at Port Radium began its life in 1930 with a strike from a prospector's pick. It broke the Belgian Congo's cartel price on radium, then a miracle cancer cure worth $70,000 a gram. During World War II, the mine figured in the geopolitics of three continents, altering the world in the process, and ushering the nomadic Dene into the nuclear age. <laughs> 